Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ron Sletton. He is a research professor here in the Department of Earth and Space Science. He got his bachelor's degree in chemistry and biology here at the UW, and then got a master's degree and a PhD in civil engineering, and, but now does research with regard to uh, dry valleys in, say, Antarctica, Greenland, uh, ice in dry, cold environments. And that was, was what led him to be par become part of the Curiosity Science team. Okay, I think I'm wired here. So you guys hear me all right? Okay, um, there's two of us at the University of Washington, myself and Bernard Hale, that are involved with the, uh, with the Curiosity rover program. So um, as, as Erica said, um, I got involved with this mostly because um, of my work in the Dry Valleys, which is an analog environment for Mars. So a lot of what we learned um, early on about Mars, we actually kind of knew, and I'll show you a, a little bit about that. We knew a little bit about it before we went there, just by, by um, you know, analog environments. And you'll see, as you look at these pictures here, that there's, if you didn't know where you were, you, you could guess that you were someplace um, on Earth. So there's about 400 scientists involved in this project. And that's the MSL science team. So um, uh, we have scientists that are involved from the US that work with NASA, uh, uh, from, from Japan, from France, Spain, Russia, uh, and other places. So it's a, it's a pretty diverse team. So the overall OK, let's try it. Dimming this a little bit here. Uh, the overall goal of the project is actually to look at biological potential. And that doesn't mean we're looking for little green men. It just means we're looking for, you know, there's, there's the idea, which is being confirmed now, that there was water once on Mars. And so the real question is in biological potential, was there ever bacteria growing there? Um, and so this is, these records are looked for in, in the rock. Now, so along with looking at, um, you know, the, the biological potential, and this is, you know, mostly as we know it, that means, you know, was there water in the past in this environment? And were there environments, you know, that provided the water and the nutrients that, that could potentially um, have supported life? And then there's always the interest, um, you know, where you have water, where you have ice uh, in the future, um, you know, is there a possibility that you have some of the, the uh, prerequisites that you need um, um, for uh, life to exist? Um, in addition, uh, what we're looking at this, we're also studying the geology, geochemistry, uh, looking overall at, at the, uh, the role of water in, in weathering and in, in um, the geomorphology of the planet, and also measuring surface radiation. So these are making the best measurements of surface radiation, uh, with the goal being that we uh, really want to understand if people could actually survive on the planet if, if, if you know, someday in the future they, uh, they um, sent people there. Um, just to let you know, um, you know, the, the program Mars actually has been going on since the 70s and even before, but we had landers on, on Mars in the Viking mission in the 70s. And then this kind of picked up again in, in the early 2000s. And there's a, several satellites that are still uh, roaming around the planet. And there's been a whole series of rovers which have gotten larger in size. I'll show you some examples of this. And there's a couple of planned missions, one in, in 216 um, a, uh, to send another uh, satellite up there. There's a planet, uh, a mission plan around 2020, actually to bring samples back to Earth to, to, to analyze them. So it's a lot more difficult working kind of with uh, remotely trying to, you know, you can imagine, imagine you just looking at a little TV screen, you're kind of moving things around and, and trying to, you know, make these precise measurements. And if you screw up, you know, and things get damaged, um, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, but they do want to bring back samples uh, eventually from Mars to look at in more detail. So these are sites in yellow there where we've already landed uh, on Mars. And uh, the, the most recent one where we actually confirmed the presence of ice was a Phoenix mission. That one was not, was not a rover. And then we have the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. One of these um, is still working um, almost 10 years later. And they're, they're powered by solar panels. Um, the, uh, the current site, there was four candidate sites. So we ended up choosing Gale Crater. And, and the reason for that, I'll, I'll, I'll show you um, a, a couple of pictures of that. But basically, it's, it's a potential for looking at uh, the role of water you know, and these goals that we talked about. So this is kind of an art, artistic rendition of Gale Crater. 
and it's, this is based on the uh, on the satellite images and then and then some color enhancement. But anyhow, so this is Gale Crater. It, it's a, it's a it's a large crater, and then within the crater, there's a mound that we still don't really understand 100% why it formed. Um, but what we do see in the mound is a lot of layering, a lot of stratigraphy, and and um, as you'll see, we looked at more, more images of Mount Sharp. So this is Gale Crater. This is Mount Sharp. The stratigraphy there is like, um, you know, the if you. If you think about going down uh, an area where we have a lot of stratigraphy, like the Grand Canyon, you know, you have a record of the past events in the planet, past history. And so that was the idea, is looking at stratigraphy here. Although it's a question if, um, you know, obviously when, the, when Gale Crater first formed, everything was pretty much blasted out of the crater. And so Mount Sharp that's formed in the meantime, you know, was that a rebound or did the crater fill up and was it re-eroded? So those are still questions that are, that are being addressed. So the current rover, is a lot more bigger and more co complicated than the early the early rovers. Like in '96, the Sojourner was just kind of a tiny little guy here, and uh, so this is about the size of of, of, a, of a Cooper Mini, roughly. And I'll show you an example of that. And this is the Spirit and Opportunity. And like I said, one of these is still running, and uh, and they're basically powered on uh, from solar panels that charge up uh, rechargeable batteries. Uh, the curiosity, uh, when we look at some of the instrumentation you'll see, is, is actually nuclear power. There's a, nuclear, a small nuclear reactor on it, which um, puts out a low amount of power, but it continuously is charging the batteries. So our limitations on a, a, on a daily basis of what we could do depends on running down the charge on the battery. Then overnight, it'll, it'll recharge again. So what's interesting here is this is basically a mobile laboratory. And you have a lot of equipment here. Um, there's 17 cameras on here that are used for both looking at, at, at the surfaces, making stereo images, uh, for driving, for looking at hazards. So it's a, it's a fairly complicated um, instrument. But basically, um, uh, there's, a, there's a mass cam here, which has two of the best cameras on it, mass cam imaging cameras, along with two of the navigation cameras. And then on that is also um, a laser, which can, from a distance up to about seven meters or so, can actually uh, shoot the laser at a rock, and that'll heat the rock up, and then you'll have uh, emission, atomic emission from the rock, and you can do an elemental analysis. So it's, uh, it's actually, um, we'll see some places where, the, uh, where they blasted a rock. You can see the tiny little pits that form when they're, when they're blasting it. Essentially, it's, it's similar to an instrument we use in the laboratory here, uh, it's based on atomic emission. And, um, and that gives us, you know, the, the content like iron, aluminum, silica, manganese, and other metals that might be present in the rock. Um, we have a, a neutron activation device here, which is basically just uh, either passively uh, measuring um, um, the re-radiation from neutrons or it actively will, will irradiate the surface with neutrons. And then it gives you, a, essentially, neutrons will react with hydrogen molecules. And so that becomes an assessment of the water content. So this points down, and this measurement is made quite often. Uh, there's, this is the surface radiation. Uh, we also have a, a REMS, which is basically climates, so measure temperature, wind speed, um, and other properties like that. Most of the instruments are on this, on this turret arm, which weighs about 120 pounds. It kind of can, can stick out there. It's basically like a almost like a transformer. The arm can kind of rotate around with, with different instruments on it. And it has a, uh, uh, a alpha particle um, spectrometer, which is another way of looking at kind of an elemental analysis. Little different than the ChemCam, the laser blaster. Uh, but it gives you additional information. It's better for looking at things like salts, like uh, um, chloride and fluoride. You can do the halogens better with, with the APXS, whereas the uh, ChemCam itself is good for metals. Um, it also has a, a drill on it, and you'll see we did some drilling with the, with, with the instrument. Um, and it has um, kind of what we call a, a, a molly, which is a, like a microscopic kind of imager. So we can look very close at the surfaces. So not quite microscopic, but very close detail um, at the surfaces. So just to give you a little idea of, of this was basically uh, built in uh, at JPL uh, in Pasadena, put together by um, you know the, the lion's share. This is a big project, but the lion's share of the of the cost in these projects is actually the engineering. And so this you know a lot of what was important in this mission is the proof that they could actually land this rover and operate on Mars. And it was um, it was a, a different way that they did the landing here. Um, 
And this is just part of the team um, of mostly uh, NASA employees that, that worked on, on the rover. And here's the capsule that uh, um, actually ultimately went to the planet. And so in essence, the rover is kind of uh, built up into the capsule here. And then they, 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 we have an extra one of these rovers um, for doing some testing in Pasadena. So you can see it's kind of tucked up in the shell right there. And this is uh, the heat shield for, for descent. So there's a good scale picture. Um, we didn't send a mini to Mars, but um, uh, about the same size and the same weight. So essentially, uh, most of us that were involved with this project ended up going back to uh, Cape Canaveral um, for the launch. And, um, um, and that was, you know, it was pretty fast. I'd never been to a launch and we just, um, it was mounted on one of the, an Atlas V rocket, which has been used for a lot of other blasts. So I have these, these vehicles that they can use and reuse. So that part wasn't new. But what was new on it was how it, it landed. And so essentially, you know, rather than um, the, Fien the Spirit and the Opportunity um, landed basically as big beach balls. They had the, the rovers inside of it and they went down and they landed and they bounced, you know. But this thing weighs about a ton and you can't make a big enough beach ball to land this thing. So, th and, and they, they also were concerned about if you just use the, the uh, you know, rocket blasters when they're landing that you get up too much debris on it. So it ended up, if we have time in the end, I'll show you a little video of that because it's kind of cool. Anyhow, it would, it would separate from the cruising stage. Uh, it would descend, you have the heat shield he heating up. Um, of, of eventually they would uh, put out this, um, a large parachute. Or actually, it's not that large a parachute, but just a parachute to slow it down. Because it's, th it's starting out coming in at about 13,000 miles an hour. And you basically have to go from 13,000 miles an hour at the top of the atmosphere to zero at the surface. Um, and then eventually um, the heat shield will let off. We have a nice little picture of that. And then, and then you have the, uh, the, the landing vehicle here, which actually will, will hover over the surface and they use something called the sky crane. So they would hover over the surface with the, uh, the landing vehicle and then lower down the rover on three nylon cords. And then these nylon cords were severed. Um, and this uh, launch landing vehicle then just kind of flew off and crashed. And so there's, there's a lot of debris around, you know, where it landed. But essentially what, it what that would do is that would put the rover right down on its wheels, ready to go. And so, you know, within uh, a short period of time after landing, um, we actually had some, some pictures of, and a confirmation that things had gone okay. So this is kind of just a little image of that. So what's, what um, the engineers have been able to do much, much better over time um, is, is land with accuracy. So the first missions to Mars, like the 1966, seven, ni 1976 Viking mission, you had an ellipse like that. Uh, where you would land. So, you, so you, you know, it was really, um, you know, somewhat risky. You know, you have to find a place where you can find that large an area where you're not going to, you know, go into a pit or fall on the edge of the side of a crater or something like that. And over time, the Pathfinder was a little tighter. Spirit and Opportunity was a little tighter. Phoenix was, was pretty good. But then this last one here, this is actually the size of, of the landing ellipse where they, where they uh, um, you know, they were confident they could land within the ellipse. And you can actually see the actual landing spot right there um, is quite good, you know, so they were, they were almost in the center of the ellipse. Here's another image of that, and it's kind of looking down at Mount Sharp, and you can see, uh, yeah, this, here's our landing spot right here, and here's Mount Sharp, and this is the edge of the Gale Crater right here. So Mount Sharp is made of, of a bunch of layers, and so, you know, right now, since we landed last August, We've mostly been working down here, and we're kind of at the base of what we believe is an alluvial fan. And I'll show you some, some reason that we believe that. So an alluvial fan just being meaning that there was water flowing down there, it moved gravels, and it formed a lake at the bottom. And there's pretty good, pretty good evidence for that. And um, um, so the plan initially was to just start driving up Mount Sharp unless we found something interesting here. And they found something interesting, so they've been, lo been looking at that. And, you know, it, it's... You, know, you never know on these, on these uh, missions, you know, how long it's really going to last. I mean, we did have a scare early, earlier on this year where one of the main computer actually um, quit. And um, it, maybe it was, you know, a bad memory. It was in the memory, memory part. Maybe it was bad memory. Maybe it was just a, you know, um, bit of radiation hit, hit, hit something, kind of knocked it out. 
But anyhow, it, it took about uh, three weeks or so to shift over to the backup computer. Um, and then, the, the, then it took another couple weeks to kind of get the, the primary computer to the point where they could depend on that as a backup computer. Um, but now it, things are working again. We're still running on the, on the backup computer, but they're, they're basically equivalent. You know, so we won't go back to the main computer again unless the backup computer goes bad. But anyhow, um, you'll see in some images here, this is more of an artistic rendition, that these layers in here, these stratigraphic layers in here, um, you know, may provide a history of, of the planet. And that's what, what the hope is. You know, we don't have time control on this. We don't know, you know, I mean, we know this, this area is old, probably, you know, well over a billion years old. You know, the, the age of Mars is somewhere around four billion years. But, you know, we, we, we know that um, we, have, we have some kind of history here, but exactly what the history is telling us, you know, remains to be determined. And so just a, a couple pictures on the descent here. So one of the cameras that, uh, of the 17 cameras, one of the cameras is looking straight down uh, at the bottom of the rover. And that's the, uh, the Marty camera, which is the descent camera. And so here, here we are coming down for landing. And the, the heat stage, uh, the heat shield has done its job. And now they, uh, they fire off the explosive bolts and shoot it away. And so they got uh, pictures of this actually uh, falling away from, from, the, uh, from the landing capsule. And then this is the base here of Mount Sharp, and these are a bunch of sand dunes we'll see in better detail later. And what was pretty fascinating when they were, when they were um, landing uh, um, the Curiosity, actually the, uh, the high-rise satellites that are around the planet, they, they had moved those in position so they could get some images of the rover going down. And in fact, they were able to get a picture of the parachute and the capsule here. And um, I mean, we didn't get that till after the fact. It's not like we got that in real time. But after the fact, they got a picture of that, and it's, and it's um, most of the debris f from, from the landing actually has been found, the uh, descent vehicle, the heat shield, along with other uh, items. So this is looking down, continuing with, 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 the, uh, uh, with the Marty camera, looking down. Here we are, you know, when the, when the descent vehicle is just hovering, when it's lowering um, the Curiosity rover. You can kind of see the... The, you know, Mars is a dusty planet, kind of blowing some of the dust away. And it actually made some scour marks here. And that was w one of our first interesting findings. And then the first thing people wanted to do is, you know, you know, you know are we, did we land properly? Is, is the rover on its four wheels? Did, you know, did it, did, it, did it survive the landing? And so they, they took um, some pictures from the, uh, they, they called these, for part of the driving, um, they have hazard cameras. Navigation cameras kind of picks the route. Then they have hazard cameras, which are looking for obstacles. And it's, um, it's actually building a DEM, DEM mesh, um, a digital kind of 3D model of the terrain as it's driving. And that's used as kind of feedback um, for, um, you know, if they're going to you know, drive over something or drive into an obstacle or something like that. But anyhow, so here we landed looking out using one of the has cameras. And this is Mount Sharp. And um, so the has cameras are, are just black white, and so this is just kind of, this is actually kind of a light light brown color. Uh, and yeah, this was a pretty amazing moment when actually um, we got the first image here. And so that, now we're looking through um, a mosaic here. So the, the, with these cameras, you know, they're 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 basically um, the, the detectors are not particularly high resolution like in regular digital cameras, but the way you get really high resolution pictures kind of, if you're familiar with like Gigapan, you know, you take mosaics, you know, and, and what these cameras are doing is they're programmed to take a whole series of shots and then they're combined in a mosaic. And you can kind of see this is like the size of one image here. So this is all one mosaic image of the surface here. And you can see the landing scours here um, from, uh, there was two scours on, on each side of the rover. And this is another artistic uh, kind of rendition of the landing. So this is kind of give you an idea of what we can do with ChemCam. So we started using ChemCam pretty quickly. And essentially, the ChemCam is the laser, remember, that does atomic emission. And we can pick a target here. And so essentially what we're getting is, is just this. This is the, the, the emission as a, as a function of wavelength. So this is the intensity, how bright the light is. And this is the wavelength. You can look at, you know, um, Visible colors are in this region. This is, this is UV. This is infrared. And by looking at the intensity versus the wavelength, um, that's how we get the concentration of these elements. So really similar to in instruments that we use in the laboratory.
So when we look close up at, at, at uh, all the samples here um, that we look at, the study sites we look at, we are given names because um, we get tired of, no, you can't remember numbers, but names are much easier to remember. So this is, rock is called Jake Matejevich. It was named after a guy that actually worked a lot on missions early on. And you can see, that here's what the rock looks like, but then if you look in more detail with the, uh, with the, uh, the MOLLE kind of you know, high resolution imaging camera, we can get a pretty good idea of what the surface topography looks like. And this is using the APXS uh, um, device, uh, which is also gives us elemental analysis. But what's different here is like for bromine and, and other halogens, you know, it does a much better job. So here we have a measure of, of the, the energy coming out and the, and the, and the counts. So basically a, an intensity measurement. And that'll give us also an elemental um, kind of composition of the rock. And we look at different areas using APXS or, or ChemCam at these rocks to get the, the composition. Almost everything on Mars is basalt, you know, um, in one form or another. So the, uh, the landing site was named after a science fiction writer. And, um, and so far we, we've been traversing, you know, sampling along the way. And, and this is the area here, which we, we actually believe we're on an old lake bed. And I'll show you some examples of that. So this is the bottom of that alluvial fan. And so we, we, we've, uh, we haven't traveled all that, all that far uh, in, in distance, actually. You can see this is 240 meters. So we've gone just a bit over a half kilometer. And we have um, a long distance to go up Mount Sharp. Um, but anyhow, um, what's kind of curious here is you can see this kind of bluish color here. And that belies the fact that it, it's um, in these, in these kind of images when the color is stretched, you know, basalt kind of shows up as blue. And a lot of the dust on Mars is, is really iron rich, so it's kind of that brownish, reddish color. And so when, when the rover landed, it actually blasted off the dust, so it got down to the bedrock material. And so in a number of these areas, you can see where it's kind of been blasted off the surface. And then we, here's the bottom of the alluvial fan, and we, uh, we moved into here, and there's some fractured deposits here. And these are kind of like, uh, like old dried lake beds. When, when lake beds, if you've seen some old, like, analogy, even to old, like a mud puddle. When a mud puddle um, you know, dries up, a lot of times you get fractures in it. And same thing will happen in large lakes, when you get larger fractures in there. And that's also, you know, tells us a little bit about the, uh, the material there. This is another example showing, um, we can actually see the, the, the route of the, uh, the rover from the high-rise images. And here you can see uh, the two scar marks where it blasts the, the, the dust off the uh, surface there. So now um, we have a couple deposits here we looked at. And again, you know, there's different ways you stretch the colors and it brings out different things. But I'm going to show you a couple examples of some of the rocks we looked at here and why we think there's water. Uh, one of the first areas we, we looked at um, is the area that was scoured where the, uh, where, the, where the Curiosity landed. And we found these conglomerates here that uh, basically conglomerates are, are rocks like with class that are held together by by some matrix. It could be a salt matrix. In this particular case, it's probably, probably sulfate. And, um, and you've probably seen rocks that, um, you know, there's some examples here hanging on the wall of conglomerates where they're, they've got class that are just held together by a, by a matrix. And then uh, we, we found another, you know, along this area, we found another spot here where we had um, some of this matrix kind of coming apart here and dropping off the rock. And these rounded rocks here are really indicative of rocks that have been, been, been worked in water. And this was the first kind of exciting, you know, kind of thing saying, okay, you know, it really does look like there was water here. I mean, for a long time, you know, the, the idea that there's been water and water flowing on Mars has been, has been out there and people, you know, most people actually believe that, but we haven't had direct evidence, you know, from the surface. And so what this is, is showing that, we, you know, we have these rounded rocks and cobbles um, that look like they've been water worked. And then, you know, over time, you know, they've basically, formed layers and salt has, has gotten in there and there's been probably some uh, material on top and you form these um, conglomerate rocks. <coughs> so we're, we're up right here, um, this is the name of the little uh, river that comes down and we have the alluvial fan in this area right here. Uh, and this is just an elevation map showing the kind of low point here 
and this is where we've been looking at um, some of these lake beds. <coughs> and if you look in the high-rise images, um, let me turn the lights all the way down for this. It's a little bit hard to see, but here's kind of the drainage coming down, and here's the fan right here. So if you look at, at things like in Google Earth, you can see areas where you see these kind of alluvial fans. And so, so we're actually kind of down off the end of the, not quite there, but off, we're off the end of the fan in here. And that's where we're, we've been for about the last two months or so. Uh, these are the uh, basaltic sand dunes, and, and this is the route we actually want to move um, on our way to, to, uh, to Mount Sharp. So we also will look at the loose sediments on the surface. And this is um, an area we call rock nest. And basically, this is a wind tail here. Looks like this. You look at the crest of it here. So there is a device on, on the rover also uh, where we can scoop up this material. And, and, then, and then one of the instruments on that I didn't mention yet is, is SAM, which is basically um, a chemical uh, laboratory in itself. It has a mass spec in it. Um, it has a tunable diode laser for looking at isotopes. It's you know, a very sophisticated instrument. It can heat its samples up and look at what gases evolve. It can do a, uh, atmosphere analysis. Um, but we can only, uh, for solids, we can take, pull gases in there, but for solids, we can only pull solids in that are less than 150 microns or so in size. And we don't want to put a lot of big rocks in there or damage the scoop. So we first drove over this little wind tail here just to make sure that it, in fact, was, was fine grain material, which, which it is. Um, and then we uh, use the scoop here to scoop up some material, and then it'll be sieved. You can see where we took several scoops there. And this is kind of the cut here of, of where it was um, looked at, or was dug into. So this just, just shows a couple kind of things we can do here. Um, we, we can also look at the gases that are, that are released on heating the rock. As you heat the rock up, you know, the question of, you know, is, it, is there water vapor there? So we're looking, looking at this. There is water vapor there. Uh, water vapor doesn't mean liquid water. You, water vapor can exist as just absorbed water on surfaces. You can have hydrated salts, just like if you, you know, if you leave your table salt sitting out long enough, you know, it turns into a kind of like a brick. And that's water that's, you know, really getting in there, making it all stick together. Uh, look at CO2 vapor. And um, this, this is basically being run through a, a, a mass spec to look at this. We can also do x-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction is a way to look at, at rocks. If you look at uh, most rocks have a crystal lattice. And the spacing of the crystal lattice will, will help you identify the, the mineral. And so, uh, you know, the interest, you know, mostly we're using the x-ray diffraction for looking at, at clay minerals, phyllosilicates. And clay minerals uh, are really indicative of weathered rocks. They're, they're secondary minerals. And they're, they're a sign that you've had uh, wet conditions. This is just for fun. It's just a self-portrait uh, taken from the Molly arm, minus the arm, because you can't take a picture of the, your arm when you're taking your own picture. Um, atmospheric measurements are made. This kind of gives you an idea of, of the temperature range on Mars. It, it goes from just above freezing, uh, about 37 Fahrenheit, to down to about minus 131 Fahrenheit. This is on a daily cycle. So there's huge temperature fluctuations going on. That's also an engineering concern because materials are going to expand and contract a lot. Um, but it's also quite interesting because we're, we're interested in the moisture in this and, and how that changes over time. Uh, we also look at the pressure. And the, the, because of, the, of that large temperature variation, there's a large fluctuation in pressure on a daily basis. And there's also a, a seasonal change in pressure. This Sol 31 is... is um, 31st day that we were there. This is our 93rd day. A Mars day is about the same length as an Earth day. It's just slightly different. We call it a sol rather than a day. Um, and what's, what's, what's happening here, basically, the pressure is changing um, because as you have warming, uh, you're having, there's a lot of CO2 at the poles on Mars. And some of that CO2 is volatilizing and then increasing the gas concentration. So you're having a higher pressure. Um, the other thing that's being measured along the way is, is the daily uh, variation in the radiation. And so different spikes, just to get an idea of you know, how much is coming into the planet, you know, you know what, what the radiation is. 
And this was also looked at um, over the whole course of the mission as, as it was, as it was flying um, towards Mars. And you had these huge spikes of radiation. And, and these actually um, uh, are due to solar flares. So they could, just, they could record those along the way. And those, you know, those are, can be bad, um, obviously, for the instruments. And uh, in addition, um, the DAN instrument, the, the neutron activation thing I showed you that measures the water content, you know, as we're moving along, we're making these measurements of the ground below us looking for hydrogen. And it can be, hydrogen can be either in hydrated salts, it can be in ice, or it can be in water. So that's part of the look for you know, where, where the water content changes in the soil. Uh, we did an atmospheric analysis, so here you can see what the atmosphere of Mars looks like. Uh, it's mostly carbon dioxide, about 96%. About 2% argon, pretty inert gas, about 2% nitrogen, 0.1% oxygen, um, and a little bit of carbon monoxide. So not really um, um, too habitable as is. And there's, a, there's also a little bit of water in there. We can look at the... Uh, uh, stable isotopes of the, of the water molecules using this uh, tunable diode um, laser setup. And this is also in, in, the, in, the, in the, the chem chemical kind of analytical um, um, instrument that's sitting on there. Okay, so this is where we're now. We call it Glen Elg in, in Yellowknife. And so we've moved uh, to the point where we're uh, from the Bradbury landing site. We've been sampling all along the way here. And now we're kind of at the, at the, this is the, the bottom of this kind of alluvial fan. We call this Yellowknife Bay, uh, Point Lake, and then a number of de deposits in, in this vicinity right here. So we have a lot of layered kind of rocks in here that, that you, know, you know, possibly are, are indicative of uh, old layers of um, water laying materials. And, it, you know, when we first looked at this, it was, you know, lots of questions on, is it water, is it wind, is it volcanic? And, you know, now we're, we're coming to the consensus now the water has been involved. Maybe there's been other features also, uh, other factors important, but um, water certainly was involved. Um, so now we're heading into Yellowknife Bay. You can see this looks kind of like a, like a no man's land here, but it is actually pretty, pretty interesting. So here's, uh, by, by uh, Yellowknife Bay, we have these fractured surfaces here, which we believe are old lake muds, uh, most likely. And uh, you can see the surface here. And this is where we're, the recent campaign is to look at more detail at these materials and actually by, by drilling into it and analyzing um, the materials that we, we pull out from the, the core holes. So just looking at the surface here, we have a lot of concretions. Uh, we have a lot of these veins, which we know are calcium sulfate now. And you know, it's not that different where you might find calcium sulfate veins uh, on Earth. And so there's, there, you know, there, we do have analog. I mean, what we know from Earth you know, really helps us uh, you know, explain what's on Mars. Not everything is the same, obviously. But, you know, rocks are rocks, more or less. Uh, so here's another area um, close to there. This is just about 20 centimeters. Lots of concretions. And concretions are oftentimes suggestive of water. You know, um, concretions form because there's water presence. Little particles can precipitate. So in this area is where we did our drilling. So we selected a target in this really fractured kind of platy material. And um, so we'll, we'll, you know, we need a pretty stable substrate. So we have different sites that we, we, we considered and, and looked at. We'll first do the, uh, you know, the non-invasive sampling like the APXS or the ChemCam, uh, and we'll, we'll take images. And then based on looking at that, we'll make a final decision on, on what we want to do, you know, the more invasive sampling on. Uh, there's a little stainless steel brush um, on, on the instrument, and with that we can brush off the surface. And you can see when we brush off the, the really iron-rich dust, it's pretty gray underneath. And this was also interesting because we think of like old uh, lake sediments, um, if they're reduced, you know, they're, they're going to have more of a grayish color. Um, this is just to show that at some of the places where we have the veins, we actually have a, a, a spike in the, uh, what is believed to be the sulfate.
So this is basically the arm in action when we're, you know, when we're, when we're using the imaging or brushing things off or the APXS um, or doing the drilling. And so here's uh, the drill hole. And uh, so basically it's, it's a hole, it's about two inches in diameter and we can go down about six inches total. And it's just a little uh, percussion hammer drill. And then after we drill, we'll have to, to uh, there's, there's a, uh, but after, as we're drilling it, there's a hole in the center of the drill bit and the, and the tailings will come up through the hole and then be collected and that's what's analyzed. So here you can see, uh, I told you I'd show you some where they had some of the laser shots. So this is from the ChemCam laser marks where we analyze this and kind of just pick a pattern here. Each one of these holes actually, it's not from a single shot of a laser. They actually will, will blast it over and over and over again and, and just acquire the, the data and average it in order to, to get, to get a, um, you know, a, a good value on it. And here's another transect that was done across the brushed area through the tailings deposit. And that's telling us a lot about um, you know, the, uh, the, metal, the, uh, the metal content, the salt content. And then along with uh, um, you know, the elemental composition, you know, we can get the mineralogical composition using the, uh, the X-ray diffraction unit that's on, on the instrument. And so these are just basically, um, like I was telling you, the, the crystal layers will have characteristic reflections. And by looking at that, we can see that actually, the, you know, another one of the, the big findings was that there are clay minerals uh, present in the lake beds there. And the clay minerals, um, you need water to form clay minerals. And so there's, there's uh, about 20 to 50% to amorphous material or clay minerals. And that was a, actually a pretty significant finding that you know, indicates that there was water in this, in this area. Again, this is just to kind of show, we, we will heat the sample up. We have different ramps for heating up the sample, and then we can look at, at what's evolved coming off the sample to get an idea of the, uh, the water content, the oxygen, the CO2. Um, the same instrument is actually used heating up the sample and, and volatilizing components in the search for organics. So, so really, you know, we're not going to, there's no expectation that, that they're going to find, um, you, know, you know, old, even, even old microbes. But the hope is that maybe there are some residual uh, organic compounds that are characteristic of, of past kind of uh, microbial growth. Oops. Um, okay, so the conclusion was made that, that uh, Yellowknife Bay is habitable. Um, there's frying gain rocks, you know, suggestive of it's a, a you know, water work system. Uh, mineralogy indicates that it uh, was not too acid or too alkaline, uh, formed phyllosilicates. Key ingredients are there, um, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, um, and also is of an oxidation state um, that could possibly provide energy. Some, some bugs will, will actually uh, get their energy from the oxidation or, or reduction of, of minerals. We have these chemolithotrophic bacteria that um, we, we find on Earth that can, can live in environments that are essentially get inorganic energy. So where we're going now is, is towards Mount Sharp. Uh, we're going to finish up in, in Yellowknife Bay. We're going to drill one more hole. You know, uh, unless we find the Holy Grail, we'll be moving on in about a month or so. And uh, the Holy Grail being something more indicative of, of past life. And, uh, but, but we, we expect we're just going to kind of confirm what we've already seen. We want to get to this area, Mount Sharp. The satellite images and the color spectra really indicate that there's a lot of uh, more phyllosilicates and more salts in this area. So we want to look in this area in more detail. So you can kind of see where we're, where we're planning on going. Across the landscape, here's the, the, the sand dunes. We actually don't want to go through the dunes because we don't want to be, get the rover stuck in the dunes. Um, and then we, so we're going to go around the dune field and then start moving up uh, Mount Sharp. And you can see, see these are a lot of the layers that um, I was telling you about on Mount Sharp. And as you look at an angle like this, you can see there's more of these layers here. So we have a long way to kind of uh, pick our pathway up here. And, you know, we, we, we can drive maybe 20 to 50 meters a day. And we have, you know, a number of kilometers to go. So
So this is along the pathway. And just to kind of give you an idea, that little dot right there is about the size of the rover. And so, you know, it's going to be, a, it's, it's going to be a, an adventure kind of, kind of driving up there. Um, um, yeah, so there's, you, 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 I think you have the handout on this. There's a couple of um, websites you can look at for more information. And, um, you know, the, the nominal mission is, is supposed to go for about, uh, uh, you know, two years. And, and then if everything is going well, you know, we'll conti obviously continue. They'll continue as long as the rover is, is alive and healthy. So I did, I did get, have one video here that I wanted to show you because I think it it's, uh, kind of gives an idea about the, the intensity of landing night. Can I start it over? I think you might have to mirror your, mirror your display in order to get it to work. Okay, so give me give me start in the beginning again here. Maybe we could start all over again. Just right, it's game over. 
slam into the atmosphere, it develops so much aerodynamic drag power and heat shield. It heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicles not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we have never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. It's a neck snapping nine shoes. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it will only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down and block us. Once we turn those rocket motors on, we don't do something. We're just going to smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical diver fly off to the sun, diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar see where we're going to land, and we head straight down to the bottom of the crater, right beside a six kilometer high level. You can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground, because if you were to descend compulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud would then go and land on the rover, it could damage mechanisms, and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crater. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long, and then gently deposit it on its wings on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover. So now you can see how those scour marks got there and also when that heat shield was being, being dropped off there. So a lot of this mission, part of it was to prove that they could actually land a vehicle like this and they were successful. So it was, it was, it was really kind of a, a nail biting time, you know. So the next one will probably be landed in the same kind of way. Yep. Can we have a quick, any quick questions? I had one from online. Is the ultimate goal to actually get all the way to the top of Mount Sharp? Um, we'll go up it as far as we can. Okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, the actual, there's interest going up Mount Sharp, but whether we make it to the, it's not mountain climbing, but, you know, it's, it's science. <laughs>